probably for me, oh, the yeah. only thing more okay. exciting than Activity Pub Conf itself happening right now is having Mark Miller as the keynote for Activity Pub Conf. And, uh, um, and, and so I, uh, I admire Mark for a number of reasons, one of which is that he's the only person I know who's extremely well informed and also still seems optimistic about the future of humanity, so that's one. Um, and also, uh, I, I'd also say that uh, I, I had a conversation with him once where we were walking around and we were talking about some of the standards work that he's done and I said, well, do you think that some of that standards work, because Mark's done quite a bit on JavaScript standardization, do you think that that was a distraction from your main goal of you know, advancing you know, security in this space? And Mark said, oh no, I think that I'm very proud that the last 30 plus years I've managed to stay focused on the vision and everything's culminating right now. And so I wanted to give a little bit of uh, history about what Mark's background is and how it relates to this space. So first of all, Mark Miller was one of the main people in Xanadu, which was a precursor to the World Wide Web that we have today and informed many of its ideas. And maybe even had a lot of ideas that were better than what we ended up getting. But, you know, some of those ideas are actually coming around today as we speak, you know. Sometimes they're just, things are just before their time. Uh, and it, but I think that really where the journey starts here is the Agoric papers that Mark Miller wrote in 1988, which laid out a, like, really out there vision for a society of distributed computational machines uh, and where humans are in that loop of computation uh, and it really is a society. But my understanding is Mark didn't know how to build that society of computing machines when he first wrote it, is that correct? That's correct. And so he, but he ended up learning that through his friend Norm Hardy who introduced him to the idea of object capabilities. Um, and, uh, but, but Mark, for over 30 years, has actually really carried the torch of object capabilities and really kind of kept that community together um, for a long time without people really realizing why it was important. And I think we're seeing a real acceleration of interest in it right now. Um, and another thing that's very relevant, I showed that video, that dancing guy and uh, that other guy's face, you know, yesterday. And that was Electric Community's Habitat, which was a distributed um, online virtual world that allowed for secure collaboration in the late 90s. And uh, those ideas, as I said yesterday, survived in the programming language E. When I was first told about E, I was already somewhat interested in OCAPs. My friend Ashish Laroya, who was working at uh, Sandstorm at the time, said, yeah, but everybody who's really interested in OCAPs um, is really excited about E. And I tried looking at the E website and I was like, what the heck is this thing? And I could not make sense of it initially. And it really took until we met in person and Mark patiently explained a lot of ideas and drew out some of the things and said, you need to see these things animated and you're gonna see some of Mark's animations of these things uh, live to really make sense of it. Um, and uh, aside from that, if all of that seems to extract from you, you actually use Mark Miller's work every day because Mark has really been pivotal in the uh, extraordinary accomplishment of making JavaScript the only language that's gotten better over time rather than worse. Um, and a lot of that is because many of the good ideas in JavaScript actually came straight from E. Um, for example, promises in JavaScript are straight out of E uh, and many other things as well. Um, and there's more things on the horizon that are really kind of like have been bubbling up that have been there in the background that, that are just starting to hit the community. And Mark has also been heavily involved in the development of web, WebAssembly. So you use a lot of work that's directly tied to the stuff Mark has done every day whether you really realize it or not. Yeah. So um, now Mark works at an organization called Agoric which describes itself as the leader in smart contracts, and it really is the leader there. But I think a lot of people in this community probably have a misunderstanding of what smart contracts is, because due to Ethereum, most people parse smart contracts as being code that runs on a blockchain. But it's not quite that. It's, it's really about enabling secure, um, secure collaboration between untrusted entities online, and, uh, um, and the work proceeds blockchains by about 25 years or so. Um, so, uh, you know, meeting Mark in person was in many ways really a life and career changing event for me. It really set a new track along the things that I thought was possible 
Um, I was interested in object capabilities, but in many ways I often dismissed them because I was, um, I, I thought all these ideas look really good on paper, but they're not usable. Um, and, and so I kept coming up to Mark and saying, yeah, OCAPs are really great, but I can't do this thing. And Mark would say, oh, we actually already figured that out. Here's how to do this thing. And I'd be like, oh, phew, oh okay. And then I'd be like, okay, yeah, but they can't do this thing. And then Mark would be like, oh, we figured that out. And I'm like, oh man, okay, this next thing solves another 10 problems I had and I didn't realize it. Okay, you're right. And then, and that was kind of a long series of engagements and Mark was very patient with me in my exploration of that. Um, so one of the biggest ones of these things, for those who know, object capabilities are about reference or possession-based authority, the same way that your ca cars, historically at least, didn't care who was driving them, it was whoever had the key was able to turn it on and make it run. But human beings care a lot about identity. Who do you decide to give a car key to? And oftentimes that decision is based off of an accrual of identity information in your mind. And it seemed to me that OCAPs just didn't have any way to do with this. And, I, and, and Mark really changed my mind when we started talking about pet names and then when he started talking about Horton, hence the Dr. Soyce reference. And by the way, Dr. Soyce is the self-proposed name of who you may have in your mind as a pet name of Dr. Seuss. Um, and, uh, um, and, and, and it turns out all these ideas can tie together and when we tie them together it actually opens us up from some of the things that we really didn't know that we could be, do before. And we have an opportunity to expand far beyond merely the kind of social network stuff that we've seen in Web 2.0 land of Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that to something way beyond that. But we're going to need the ideas that Mark and his colleagues have been working hard on in order to be able to do that. So with that all in order, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Mark. Oh, wait. No, wait. I'm not going to hand over the mar microphone to Mark. I wanted to say one more thing. This is a real personal request. So when Morgan and I often sit down, what we do for fun in the evenings is to sit down and read and drink tea because we're boring people and we like being boring people, right? And you know, we both choose our books. Very frequently, this is the book I end up reading. Do you recognize this? Can you, can you say what this book is? This is my PhD dissertation. Can you read out, could you read out the title? I've got to say, the number of people who recreationally sit around reading dissertations is probably fairly small. <laughs> Robust composition towards a unified approach to access control and concurrency control. So here's where it's really selfish. Mark, you know what a big fan I am. Can I have your autograph? <laughs> Anywhere is good. Oh, oh. But, not, but let's keep the water out of it. Can we get some napkins? That would be very useful. Luckily, it dispersed in a pattern that did not hit anything that would be seriously affected by water. So that's very good. Him signing is perfect because it gave us a chance to be able to clean up the water, so, you know. How strategically we pre that. Yes, that's right. Well, OCAPs are all about being able to prepare for uh, making plans together and even being able to deal with um, the limited amount of damage when plans go awry. So, Mark, please give us, uh, I don't know what else to say. Give us some information. Uh, thank you, Chris. That was an extraordinary introduction. Um, I want to say that this 30-year journey uh, was also a journey with many other people um, uh, who also uh, were very much collaborators with me on this journey. Uh, uh, too many people to list, but I want to call out just in particular, uh, the Agoric Papers were co-authored with Eric Drexler. Uh, and Dean Tribble has been uh, the closest partner with me through many phases of the journey, going back to Xanadu. 
going back to the origin of Promises uh, and through today as co-founder of Agoric. So, today, let's talk about architectures for creating decentralized social networks that are both robust against attacks and open to strangers. Tens of thousands of years ago, our social systems, humanity lived in systems that were neither robust nor open. We were huddled together in small tribes where within the tribe we had nice social systems of cooperation with people that we knew. You can think of those as these uh, islands of green fields of cooperation in this vast sea of poisonous violence, violence both from predators and from other people that were generally assumed to be hostile and often were hostile. Over time, we learned to invent systems that enabled us to cooperate better with each other, various patterns, various new institutions. And over time, the cooperative networks between us grew to, to, through the phase transition to where they became the spanning networks that covered the world. These vast networks of cooperation becoming this world covering green fields of cooperation with these isolated pockets of violence remaining. And it's very surprising to people to understand actually just how cooperative the world has become, and in particular, how nonviolent it has become. We're all very aware of how violent it remains, but when you actually do a good comparison with history, uh, today our world is extraordinarily less violent than it's ever been. And on this wonderful world of, not, of mostly nonviolent cooperative interaction, there emerged a new level of abstraction, which is the online world. The world of the internet, the world of the web, the world of email, and in its young days, when it first came about, it was also this very pleasant, worldwide, friendly, cooperative framework in which almost all interactions were pleasant and we could approach it with, the, with this um, simple, open-minded expectation of cooperation. And then a new form of problem started growing on the, e on the online world. And to understand the nature of the new problems that we're facing, we need to understand the difference in security between the physical world and the online world. And one example that uh, many of us might remember is in the physical world, we always had the problem of junk mail where it was a perpetual annoyance, it was a perpetual annoyance we all put up with, where we would pick up our mail and then we would manually sort through and throw away all the junk mail. But it was an annoyance that we were able to put up with because it was still feasible to sort through the mail and throw away the junk mail. With the coming of email, we had many benefits but we also had this explosion of spam. So something changed such that suddenly it became not feasible, no longer feasible to manually sort through our incoming mail and throw away the junk. There are two fundamental differences between security in the physical world and security in the online world. In the physical world, we cannot build impenetrable walls. We can build stronger and stronger walls, but for every stronger wall, there is a stronger degree of force that can be applied to it to penetrate the wall. By contrast, in the online world, we have cheap, perfect boundaries. Our hardware gives us address space boundaries, which we use to build operating systems. Our memory safe programming language, languages give us object encapsulation. 
And modern cryptography gives us cryptographic primitives, which are close enough to perfect for most purposes. Most breaks in cryptographic systems are not due to weaknesses in the cryptographic primitives. So as far as just an isolation mechanism, when all you're trying to do is create a boundary, create isolation, uh, these mechanisms are perfect. Of course, we do a lot more than just isolation. So the, the overall picture is more complicated. But the other fundamental difference is bad news for the online world. In the physical world, an attack takes scarce resources of the attacker. If nothing else, it takes some of the attacker's attention. People who make safes talk about work factor. Work factor is the effort the attacker needs to engage in to overcome the, expense, the defenses. And if the expense of the work factor is greater than the value of the valuables in the safe, you're winning. In the online world, the attacker can use automation to multiply their attack by billions at no cost to themselves. To the degree that there's any cost at all, it's often an attack, it's often a cost that the attacker arranges for the victims to pay, that the victims' resources are used to spread the attack. And as a result of this automation, a very small number of bad actors is able to multiply their bad activities by billions and flood the world again with poison. And the danger is that we react to that flood of poison by retreating back into fortresses, back into uh, isolated communities where we have nice friendly interaction within the community, but we're cut off from the larger world and we're not welcoming to strangers. That would be a tremendous tragedy for us to lose this sense of friendly worldwide cooperation. A way to think about the trade-offs is in terms of this curve. There's always a trade-off curve between cooperation and safety. In the early days of the internet, we were all naively cooperative with each other, not knowing that the nature of our cooperation left us unsafe. We didn't know it because no one was attacking us. As the attacks started increasing, the danger is that we simply go to the other end of the trade-off curve and acquire our safety at the cost of sacrificing our cooperation at a distance, our cooperation across vast networks. What we need to do instead is lift the trade-off curve. We can never get rid of the trade-off curve. There's always a trade-off, but if we lift the trade-off curve, then for the same amount of safety, we can engage in more cooperation. For the same amount of cooperation, we can engage in it in a safer manner. One form of unsafety that we've become familiar with is the unsafety that comes from centralized systems. And speaking here at Activity Bub, Pub, uh, building decentralized social systems, we're aware of the dangers that come from centralization. We want the benefits that come from decentralization. And in any social system, a key issue that becomes central is the issue of designation, is the de issue of uh, how do you name things? How do you indicate something that you're talking about? So the decentralized naming means that we cannot rely on a central naming authority, but we want names that are free from impersonation so no one can seem to be you. If someone can seem to be me in talking to my buddy, 
then they can be fishing my buddy to lead them to interact with the attacker rather than when, when my buddy thinks they're interacting with me. But we want to solve the impersonation problem without centralized naming authorities because centralized naming authorities creates a censorship problem. If we rely on DNS uh, rooted in ICANN or certificate authorities or the phone company or any other naming authority, then if our name is, is due to their activity, then they can take it away from us. We want names that no one can take away from us and names that no one can prevent someone from communicating with us if they know our name and we want them to be able to communicate. And a way to understand what these two constraints are together is by analogy with another decentralized system that has shown that essentially the same two security problems are, are simultaneously solvable. An account that you have in Bitcoin is keyed to the name of the holder of the account, i.e. the account on the, on the chain has a public key, the holder of the account knows the corresponding private key and has generated the private key public key pair. Impersonation, the resistance to impersonation is no one else can generate a private key that has the same public key and therefore no one else can spend your money. And the, the fact that you generated the key pair, you didn't depend on anybody else to do that and you're using it in a system that is de itself decentralized means no one can, can stop you from spending your money. When you cross a border, uh, no matter what the capital controls are, no matter what the border rules are, if you've memorized your keys uh, if in, that, in uh, a case where things are desperate enough where you need to do that, you can still cross your border and no one can stop you from taking your money effectively with you. So we want the same kind of security and decentralization for our knowledge and ability to communicate with each other. So there's two fundamental safety problems we need to solve, two um, basic approaches to operating in a safe manner, there's, which I divide into the proactive and the reactive. Proactively, we want to be able to engage in activities in such a way that we're safe by construction, that we, that we operate in such a way that by default we're not creating unnecessary dangers. But nevertheless, sometimes we'll mess up. Sometimes we'll, for example, hand out authority inappropriately. Uh, and for whatever reason, sometimes the, the, the system will operate in a way that is less safe than we intended. So we need to get, be able to engage in reactive damage control, to be able to react to the fact that bad things are now happening and we want to recover by damage control in, back into a safe situation. So the core of any security paradigm is its access control paradigm. And there are two fundamental access control paradigms, which are the authorization-based paradigms for which the main example is object capability, and the identity-based access control paradigms for which the main example is access control lists. Access control lists are the ones that you're familiar with because all of our operating systems, all the industrial operating systems that people have experienced uh, are all based on identity-based access control. And the key thing about identity-based access control is all access decisions are rooted in the question, who are you? Uh, you perform an action, the action is tagged with your identity, and then your identity is looked up somehow, and depending on who you are, the action is either allowed or disallowed. And this is, has many intuitive benefits, uh, but uh, it also has many problems, and there's a long literature on the problems. Um, the strength of this paradigm is its support 
for reactive damage control. But the problems make it very poor at proactively building safe arrangements. Object capabilities, on the other hand, uh, its advantage is very much on the side of proactively building safe arrangements. As Chris mentioned, uh, the car key is a perfect example. Uh, the car key is a right. It's a bearer right. It's one that I, I have the right by holding the key. And if I want to lend Chris the ability to drive my car, I just hand him the key. I don't have to tell my car that Chris is now able to drive my car. And the result is that we can delegate individual authorities in a fine grain and piecemeal manner, in a flexible manner, and do it in a way that supports the principle of least authority, which is the principle that each agent, both other people and software agents executing on our behalf, are given the minimal authority that they need to carry out what we, the request that we're making. And by minimizing how much excess authority we give them beyond that minimum, we minimize the potential for abuse. But sometimes uh, we will give out too much authority. Sometimes we'll give authority to someone we regret having given it to. And then we, want, we need to react to having gotten ourselves into that bad situation with some kind of reactive damage control. So what we need to do is build a system that has both of these strengths. And there's really, with these two foundations, there's really three logical ways to go about this. One is we can start with the foundational mechanisms of access control lists, and we can use those mechanisms in a surprising manner to support the benefits of the left-hand column. And there have been some very good uh, systems that have done this, uh, Polaris, Plash, and Bitfrost. And these are interesting, they're worth studying. If you're stuck with access control foundations, it's worth engaging in those techniques to, to use them in a safer manner. But these systems have problems under composition, they don't compose well, and they only help one more level deep. Uh, and then they stop helping. Uh, so experience has shown us that this, is, that this helps, but it's not the solution that we can take forward. In the 1970s and 1980s, there were a variety of systems that engaged in what we call hybrid capability systems. This is a very intuitively obvious approach for combining the, both strengths here, which is just build foundations that have both the object capability mechanisms and the access control list mechanisms in the foundations, and then an action is allowed only if it is allowed both by the rules of object capabilities and by the rules of access control list systems. And unfortunately, these, these systems also showed problems under composition. We built these in order to gain the best of both worlds, and we did not succeed at doing that. In some ways, uh, this way of combining the attributes gave us the worst of both worlds. So really, there's only one thing left to try, which is start with pure object capability foundations, and then try to build the attributes of the right-hand column by patterns, by creating patterns of the use of object capability foundations to get those benefits. And that's the Horton work that I'll be explaining today. But first, since it's unfamiliar, I'm going to explain object capabilities themselves. And I want you all to pay a lot of attention in particular to the visual language that I'll be using on, on this slide because uh, it's important to understand this visual language called by reusing this visual language throughout the rest of the talk. And I'll be explaining object capabilities in terms of objects of an object-oriented programming system because it's the best and closest analogy, but I want to emphasize that object capabilities 
are an abstract logic that can be built on many different substrates. There's object capability hardware, there's object capability operating systems, there's object capability live cryptographic protocols, there's object capability certificate systems. Um, but I'm going to stay with the terminology and the analogy of objects because it's closest to the logic that we're familiar with from object-oriented programming. So over here in this diagram, uh, the circles A, B, and C are three objects. And the thin arrow are object references, are pointers from object to object in a memory-safe language where they're protected pointers, they're unforgeable. So in this state, these initial conditions, Object A has a reference to object B, points at object B. Uh, object A points at object C, and B does not point at C. And in this situation, object A can execute code like B.foo of C. And one way of describing this is A is invoking the foo method of object B with the parameter being C. The way I'll be describing it is another way common among object programmers, which is A is sending the message foo of C, is sending that message to B, and the, the parameter C is a copy of A's pointer to C. And A is able to do this because A already has a pointer to B and A already has a pointer to C. And when B receives the message, B now has a pointer to C. So the main difference between objects and object capabilities is that these messages sent on these references in an object capability system are the only means by which an object can cause effects on the world outside of itself. The references, the thin arrows, are the permission system. In the initial conditions, when B did not have a pointer to C, B could not invoke C, B could not send it a message, B could not provoke whatever activities would follow from invoking C. A, by invoking B, both exercised its permission to invoke B and granted B permission to invoke C. So it has all of these nice benefits, but from the perspective of reactive damage control, when used directly, um, it has the problem that all activity is anonymous. That object C, when it receives a message, doesn't know if the message came from A or came from B. So the obvious approach, one might think, to solving this is to tag the message somehow, or to enable something like stack introspection, where C can, can somehow ask, was this message sent by A or B? But there's a problem with that approach. That was essentially the hybrid capability approach. There's a problem with that approach, which is objects are ephemeral. They come and grow with great, great velocity. By the time somebody looks at what happened as a result of messages to C and decides that a particular message in retrospect, should be judged, judged as abusive, there is no object A anymore. Object A has already gone away, so is object B. Attributing responsibility to the individual objects is pointless. Um, but providing permission at the granularity of individual objects is what enabled us to proactively build a system that was highly safe to begin with. So what we need to do is separate the granularity at which we grant permission, which wants to be as fine-grained as possible, from the granularity at which we assign responsibility for bad actions so that we can retroactively say, uh, Alice, the, per the, the larger unit, which let's say is a person, that these objects executing on Alice's behalf have sent messages that in retrospect we judge to be abusive, so we're going to stop accepting messages from Alice. So these, these large grain responsible identities can be people, can be corporations, can be other organizations. Uh, the key thing is that there's something 
that's at a granularity where they have a lifetime and an identity that's meaningful to a human being who's looking at the abuse and making a judgment about cutting off access. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to identify responsible identities with individual human beings. So proactively, when abuse has not happened yet and no one has made any uh, damage control decisions, we want a system that just operates as a simple object capability system in which object A that happens to be run by Alice can send a message to object B that happens to be run by Bob. So before uh, any abuse has happened, we want to build a system in which A can act as if it's pointing directly at B, and where A, when it executes that piece of code, sends a message towards B. But what actually happens to enable the reactive damage control is that the message doesn't immediately go all the way to the object B, rather it goes to, to Alice's outgoing sentry and the sentry first asks the question, this is Alice's sentry for the ob that represents the object B within Alice. The sentry first asks, do I still make use of Bob's services? Uh, and since uh, no damage has happened yet, the answer at this point is yes. But the sentry still records that we're asking Bob to deliver the foo message to B. Notice that we're recording Bob as the responsible entity, even though, even though at the object level we're sending the message to B. Having recorded that, we send an encoding of the message over to Bob's incoming sentry, which first of all does the check, do I still honor Alice's requests? And since, again, since no abuse has happened yet, the answer is yes. But Bob Sentry still writes down that we're about to deliver the message foo to the object B on behalf of Alice so that in retrospect we can decide to hold Alice responsible. And with all that bookkeeping having happened, we now proceed to deliver the foo message to B. So I'm going to use this graphic for the rest of the talk as shorthand for that system of sentries. Every time you see this graphic, this is an identity tunnel, you should understand that there's an object at each end acting as a sentry for the respective parties. There have been systems that have been built by these principles, the scoops system at uh, HP Labs, uh, secure cooperative file, file sharing, which was a decentralized file sharing system where various parties could arrange to propagate file updates to each other and to keep track of who they've given permission to get a file update and who they've given permission to receive a file update from, who I've given permission to update my copy of the file based on their changes. And the scoop system keeps track of the updates, so if I find that a particular file of mine has become full of garbage, and I can see that the update itself came from Marcus, and I can decide to cut off Marcus's further access. So I'm holding Marcus responsible. But what is the unit that I'm holding responsible? It's a little bit too simple to say that the unit is simply Marcus the person. These spheres represent our units of responsibility in the system. Um, Alice, the human, interacts with the system by interacting locally with her software running on her machine. I'm assuming a fully federated system here. Um, uh, and she interacts with that software through her local user interface. Her software then sends messages over the network to Bob's software that then renders through Bob's user interface 
information that Bob the human being can then react to. If Bob is getting abusive messages that is from the Alice unit, Bob doesn't need to know or care are these abusive messages coming because Alice is running malware or because Alice has turned evil and decided to send malicious messages. Uh, so in both cases, Bob will simply hold Alice responsible for the bad action of her objects. That's not a moral judgment. The if, if Alice is running malware, which is sending the bad messages, it's not Alice's fault in some sense, but still, Bob has to hold Alice as a whole responsible for the bad actions of her software in the absence of any other evidence. With this picture, we can now better understand what the issues are in doing a decentralized naming system with integrity. Because there are several different languages going on here that are being translated between. If Alice, let's say, wants to send a message to Bob, where Alice is telling Bob, here, use this lamp. She's communicating to Bob permission to turn this lamp on and off. So what Alice sees through a user interface is something that has to be human meaningful at the user interface level, something that Alice can feasibly understand what it is she means to be designating, but where the meaning of those designators is really what it is they designate, that she's sending the message to the person that she thinks of as Bob, and that the lamp that she's giving permission to Bob to switch on and off is the lamp that she thinks she's giving permission to. Her local software translates this into the internal language of her local software, which let's say is a language of messages between her local objects, where somehow in that local language, there's also a representation of which lamp the permission is being uh, conveyed to. And then that gets translated, let's say, into a cryptographic message where there's a cryptographic representation of permission to use the lamp, which not only designates the lamp, but actually provides the permission so that Bob receiving that um, cryptographic permission is, is now able to use the lamp, whereas otherwise he would not have been able to use the lamp. And that, when received by Bob's software, gets translated back into the internal language of objects, and then Bob's software, in turn, renders it into Bob's user interface, where the concrete representation that Bob sees might be different than the concrete representation that Alice sees. We don't care about that. What we care about is that they both mean the same thing, that the lamp that Alice meant to give to Bob that when Bob receives it, he knows that the lamp that he's now talking to is the lamp that Alice meant. So to achieve this, we need a naming system that has three key properties. It ha we start with the ones that we presented earlier of the de under decentralized designation is it has to be free of danger of impersonation. Uh, no one can appear to Bob to be a different Alice than the one that, that Bob thinks of as Alice. And in particular, uh, with regard to the lamp, that no other lamp can, uh, can invade the system and appear to Bob to be the lamp that Alice meant. And censorship resistance means that we cannot depend on an external centralized naming authority. It needs to be human meaningful because these names have to show up in the respective user interfaces. So any user interface that tries to identify something by showing a human being a big cryptographic key is a failure. 
that should never need to appear in a user interface where a, a human being needs to understand what entity it designates. So we need some kind of user, human meaningful designators, such as human meaningful names. And it needs to be globally meaningful. So like a cryptographic key, the cryptographic key that enables use of the lamp, once it's encoded in cryptography, it can go anywhere on the network and no matter who it came from or where they were when they said it, it, can, it, it, it in a global manner, in a context independent manner, grants authority to use that lamp. So Zuko's triangle is the insight that there is no one kind of name that can have all three of these attributes. However, we can have feasible kinds of names that have any two of the three. And we're already familiar, very familiar, uh, with a naming system where the naming system shows us how to get all three attributes by having multiple kinds of name in the naming system where each kind of name only has two out of three, but the naming system translates between these names. So we all have phones with contact lists in them, and the name that we place into the contact list is our pet name, the name that we privately choose for the various parties we're communicating with. They never, even when we communicate with them, they never know what our pet name is, what our contact list name is for them. So when Alice calls Bob, she might look up Bob in her contact list. The Alice's software then translates between her contact list and the phone number. Now the phone number is a numeric address that's not human meaningful, but it still depends on the phone company, so it's not censorship resistant, but imagine that was a cryptographic key instead. When Bob receives the phone call, he, his software gets the phone number of Alice and once again translates in the other direction through his contact list from the address back to the pet name. And the levels of translation that we saw between the various layers as we went from Alice the human to Bob the human correspond to the opportunities to do this translation in the system. In a social network, the interesting introduction, the interesting other objects, other things for Alice and Bob to talk about are not lamps, but other people. And other people themselves are also, have their own software and are in the same kind of relationship as Alice and Bob. Uh, so before we get into the technical details, I want to mention something that happened to me this morning on the way to Activity Pub, which is I called Uber. And then something amazing happened. Somebody that I've never met before showed up in a car that I've never seen before, and I got into that car. Also, from the perspective of the driver. Something amazing happened. They stopped the car, and somebody that they've met before walked up and opened the door, and the driver drove off with that stranger in the back seat. Why is it that this works, and it works so well that we're now starting to take it for granted? And the reason is that Uber, represented by the radio tower in the left-hand corner, in the role of Alice, has communicated to both Bob and Carol enough information that they can authenticate each other. Now, what authenticate each other, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that Carol knows precisely who Bob is, that Bob is a particular person that lives at a particular address, because it wouldn't be meaningful to her anyway. That's not the question that she's asking. The question that she's asking is, is this the Bob that Uber meant to introduce me to? And likewise, Bob is asking, is this the Carol that Uber meant to introduce me to? 
So Uber provides them enough information to authenticate each other, following which the ride happens and I arrive at Activity Pub. So what this looks like in terms of the elements in our system is that Alice, Bob, and Carol are both these spheres with a human component and an object component. And Alice sends to Bob a message using her pet name for Bob in the to field. But the key thing that uh, this system does that our phones don't do is she can use her pet name for Carol in the body of the message. And she does it in such a way that her software understands that that's intended to be a use of a pet name, so her software knows to translate it. So she's telling Bob, meet Ms. Smith, because Ms. Smith happens to be Alice's pet name for Carol. That turns into an object-to-object -object message, which is sent into the identity tunnel, because the argument is over another identity tunnel, that causes an infrastructure message called intro to be sent um, uh, to arrange the introduction. And the meaning of that introduction message is that Alice is, Alice is asking Carol to provide Bob access to Carol's object C. That's the meaning of the introduction message. And Carol might never have heard of Bob before, and vice versa, but she's, here's Bob's identity uh, in the introduction message, so what she knows she needs to do is set up an identity tunnel for Bob's use. And using the name of Bob that she heard from Alice, uh, Carol wraps Bob's end of the identity tunnel, gift wraps it in such a way that only Bob can unwrap it, and, and when Bob unwraps it, he knows that only Carol could have wrapped it. And having created that wrapped gift, Carol returns that to Alice, that then uses it in the encoding of the message sent through the identity tunnel, that Bob then unwraps, recreating the meaningful meet message but whose parameter is now carried over the new identity tunnel by which Bob and Carol hold each other responsible for the activities that happen over that new identity tunnel. And Bob's software, when it receives that message, finally translates it through the user interface into a message as received from and then renders whatever Bob's pet name for Alice is, and then the message might be meet at Carol if Carol, let's say, is already Bob's pet name for Carol. But at this point in the protocol, do Bob and Carol really know, does, well, does Carol really know that Bob is independent of Alice? Does it really make sense for Carol to treat Bob independently? Well, the answer is no, and the answer is necessarily no, irrespective of the mechanism. In any such system, at this point, the answer must be no, that uh, if Carol has only met Bob online through this one introduction, that Carol has to wonder, is Bob a pseudonym for Alice? And because Carol is, uh, can't tell that Bob is not a pseudonym for Alice, whatever bad behavior Bob engages in, Carol has to hold Alice responsible for it as well. It's still meaningful for Carol to hold Bob responsible and for her to do all the bookkeeping needed to do that, let's say that Carol and Alice have a history of good interactions, of friendly behavior, so that uh, a minor bad message from Alice uh, would cause Carol to maybe demerit her, her sense of Alice's trustworthiness 
by one, but not to cut off access. On the other hand, if a bad message comes from Bob, well, Carol has no history with Bob. Carol holding Bob responsible means that one bad message is enough to cut off Bob's access, but Carol should still demerit Alice's um, access by one, make, uh, suspect that Alice might be starting on a pattern of abuse, but know that Bob might be independent. And Bob has the same problem. He's never heard of Carol before. Is Carol a pseudonym for Alice? Secure Scuttlebutt is a decentralized social network based on pet names that shows us the right basic approach for dealing with this question, which is only joint introductions corroborate independence. What does that mean? What this hover is showing in Secure Scuttlebutt, let's say showing to Carol, is that all of these different people have introduced Carol to the same Bob. And because they're all introducing her to the same Bob, that gives Carol significant evidence that Bob is independent of any one of them. In our notation, we've gone from this situation to this situation, when Dave performs a second introduction between Carol and Bob, that gives Carol some evidence that Bob should be treated as independent of both Alice and Dave. And the same introduction also gives Bob evidence that Carol should be treated independently. So we've shown how to build a decentralized federated social network with naming integrity, where the names are not subject to either impersonation or uh, censorship. We've done it through the means that Chris Weber, I love the term uh, networks of consent. These introduction messages are messages that players within the system have chosen to do to introduce people they know to each other. And the introductions are meaningful because they're coming from people that, that you know. Have we succeeded at building a system that is welcoming to strangers? Well, in many ways, yes, but in some fundamental ways, not yet. We have not yet succeeded at our overall goal. And the reason is something that from these uh, uh, criteria we should take to be a weakness of a pure object capability perspective on the problem, which is object capabilities have the slogan, only connectivity begets connectivity. If you have two isolated subgraphs, they remain forever isolated because no one can introduce them. So this can degenerate into the fortresses that I've talked about, it can degenerate into the phenomena that's sometimes called the old boys network, where a stranger coming in from the outside has no way to the knock on the door of a community that they'd like to participate in and enter and become accepted and become friends with the people in that community. And that means also that the communities cannot become connected to each other. So we want to add a cold calling primitive, which um, uh, uh, Chris described yesterday. Um, what I mean by cold calling is People in the network want to be able to say, here's the inbox, here's the separate inbox at which I will accept messages that don't come from an introduction. But we need to understand the danger of, of publicly providing an inbox in which people can cold call you, which is this picture again. The problem with spam was the lack of marginal cost, the lack of any scarcity per attack on the part of the attacker, enabling the attacker to multiply their attack by billions at no cost to themselves. The thing that prevented the explosion with the junk mail problem did not prevent the irritation. We still got junk mail, but prevented the explosion of the problem was the stamp. 
The stamp is a small marginal cost per message, and for a normal friendly cold call, there's a small number of stamps that you need to spend. For friendly behavior, this is not an undue burden. But if you want to send billions of such cold calling messages, then suddenly a cost per message becomes a significant burden. There was a prior decentralized federated social network that operated with these principles called pet mail. Uh, pet mail, as you can guess from the name, was also a pet name system. It also had this logic of corroboration, uh, but furthermore, it had the open public inboxes for cold calling, but it attached a, a per message cost to the cold call. It didn't do it by stamps, it didn't do it by money transfer, it did it with a CAPTCHA. And a CAPTCHA is a perfectly fine way to cause per message overhead of the attacker if CAPTCHAs still worked. Uh, given the state of artificial intelligence, we should certainly assume that CAPTCHAs cannot continue to work, and pretty much they don't, they don't work already. Uh, so some mechanism still needs to successfully cause a marginal cost to the attacker. The nice thing about stamps, the nice thing about money transfer, is it also compensates the victim. As Chris mentioned yesterday, uh, now people cold calling me, if they're cold calling me with messages that, I, that I'm not interested in, well, they've paid for the privilege and I've benefited um, uh, by receiving their payments. So this again is a slide from the uh, pet name presentation uh, showing how, let's say, Dave in this particular social network is open to cold calling. He gets cold called by a bunch of abusive other parties which he makes the mistake of further introducing into the network. So there's been some entry of some degree of abuse into the network. But with all of this support for attributing abuse and doing reactive cutoff of further access, Dave can cut off access of those outside parties and Carol can decide that Dave was kind of naive in letting those guys into the network, so Carol can decide to interact or to trust Dave less, but continue to interact with him. So what these patterns are doing is, again, enabling us to figure out how to successfully cooperate with strangers, with other people at a distance, allowing us to extend our networks of cooperation to the point that, they, that these large-scale networks of worldwide cooperation through federated decentralized systems are the ones that are the networks of relationships that cover the world, and to beat back the abusive activities back into isolated lakes of poison within this vast um, uh, landmass of green fields of cooperation. It's not a perfect solution, uh, just as it wasn't in the physical world where violence continued to happen. Uh, there will still be people like Bob at those peripheries that have to engage in skepticism, um, but the hope is that this overall system of networks of consent of cold calling with immediate feedback, of attribution, and the ability to engage in reactive da uh, damage control uh, can be at least the first step towards the patterns we need to escape from our fortresses and cover the world with decentralized networks of cooperation. So we've rebuilt an identity and a system that has the attributes that we've associated with ACL. We've rebuilt an identity-based system for reactive damage control on top of our object capability basis. How did we do compared to identity-based access control systems that people are familiar with? Well, like them, the requests were tagged. 
uh, by the identity of the requester so that with the appropriate record keeping, you could hold the requester responsible. Unlike them, we've also done the record keeping to hold the responder responsible. When Alice's software makes the foo request to Bob's software, Alice records that she's holding Bob responsible for how his software reacts to, sending, to receiving the message. And we're assigning responsibility, we're doing the record keeping to assign responsibility for introductions. So that Carol, when she receives abusive requests from Bob, can not only hold Bob responsible, but understand the introduction structure by which she came to know Bob and can hold Alice responsible to an, an, a reduced extent for Bob's bad activities. If Alice keeps introducing Carol to players that Carol doesn't like, then Alice loses points with Carol. Together, this is an architecture of robust openness. We've succeeded with at achieving naming integrity with no naming authorities. We have a skeptical aggregation strategy where Bob's bad, bad activity is still aggregated into Alice. But we have a corroboration-driven disaggregation strategy where Alice, where Carol can come to learn that she can hold Bob separately responsible and by supporting cold calling with a small cost to the sender per cold call, we have made the system open to strangers and a stranger once entering into the system uh, can no longer has that initial cost of a cold call, is now within these networks of consent introductions and can proceed to, to interact within the systems that they've entered into without paying further cold call costs. And now I'll take questions. It feels like programming an OCAP system is like learning a new language, a human language. And I'm wondering, how would we go about learning OCAP programming idioms such as composition and decomposition? Well, um, I'll give a flip answer first, which is you can uh, do what uh, Chris and Morgan are now doing recreationally, which is read my dissertation. Uh, <laughs> but uh, more seriously, um, the first thing is to pay attention to the user interface design so that the users of a system built according to these principles do not have to understand in an articulate manner the principles in order to use it safely, securely, and successfully. To make the appearance of them through the user interface something which is intuitive um, at very little effort, ideally intuitive out of the box. Uh, Chris mentioned yesterday that a group uh, from, uh, from uh, Rebooting Web of Trust, including Chris and I, and including you, are co-authoring a paper on specifically how to bring these issues out into the Mastodon user interface. Uh, to create a Mastodon-like experience that can be understood without having to sit through this talk, uh, understood intuitively to provide the naming integrity properties that we're advocating. The next thing to notice is that object, or for, with regard to just OCAPs themselves, leaving aside Horton, with regard to OCAPs themselves, the language of OCAPs, the basic idea, the, the form of patterns of OCAPs are very similar to those that object-oriented programmers, excuse me, that object-oriented programmers engage in. The abstraction with which OCAP programmers create security patterns like Horton are very much along the lines of how object-oriented programmers 
create patterns of objects to express higher levels of abstraction. We found this repeatedly, that people coming from object-oriented programming uh, can take up object capability programming very quickly. Uh, what we've also found is that people coming from other security paradigms take up object capabilities less quickly because the difference in the arrangement of computation and identity is a bigger burden than the difference between object-oriented programming for functionality versus object capability programming for both functionality and security. So, so learning object-oriented programming was something that took the world 20 years to do. So there is a, definitely a big language learning burden there, but that's a language learning burden that for that for many, many tens of millions of programmers is already behind them. Um, in addition, I should mention that my company, Agoric, um, uh, is building such a decentralized object capability system on top of a object capability runtime for JavaScript. JavaScript will, will seem surprising, uh, but I've been on the ECMAScript committee since 2007. I got the enablers, as Chris is mentioning, from E into the JavaScript standard to enable JavaScript to be used as a safe object capability programming language. And that immediately opens up the ability for programmers to write security patterns, both using object pattern concepts that they're used to and using a language that's familiar to them. Yeah. Uh, just uh, you anticipated my, my question with that last comment, but could you, uh, you tease this with the Agoric, um, uh, you tease this with the Agoric uh, innovation, and can you put it not in uh, developer context, but in the context of your presentation as a whole, uh, the role of the company or the goal of the company? I'm not sure I understand the question. What does Agoric do? Oh. Is that, is, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, at Agoric, we're building support for smart contracting that can realistically be used in large scale colla collaborative networks of commerce and complex voluntary cooperative interaction um, that again, we hope uh, to span the globe, to, to, to bring the world economy online through these primitives uh, and in such a way that we provide the benefits of rule of law to everyone cheaply. There's many, many different angles on this, but uh, Kate Sills just did a talk that's going to be up on YouTube soon uh, called uh, Can Blockchains Provide Rule of Law? Uh, there's something like 4 billion people in the world that do not have the benefits of rule of law because of the expense of lawyers and, and human adjudicators, um, uh, even in countries that do have the rule of law, it's often out of reach practically to many people in the country because the, the cost of, 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 of using the rule of law mechanisms are too great. Uh, a smart contracting fabric can enable those benefits at tiny costs, at incredibly tiny costs. We can drop the cost by eight orders of magnitude. Um, uh, and we can make the contracts unambiguous because they're code, not prose to be interpreted by humans, uh, and uncorruptibly executed because they're executed on computers that ha are, are for whatever reason, there is an arrangement such that the mutual parties to the contract can mutually trust the computer that they're run on, and I want to focus on, since I said blockchain, uh, to us, a blockchain is only one of many platforms. We're building a decentralized, distributed, smart contracting fabric on top of JavaScript that runs in a blockchain-independent manner, 
but runs also across the chains and across chains and non-chains, across both public and private systems, so that it can be a network of cooperation of maximum reach. To us, the important thing about a blockchain is it's a mutually trustworthy computer so that a program running on a blockchain as the computer that it's running on, there can be worldwide credibility that the program executes according to what the code of the program says. And that's, and clearly for some contracts, that's very valuable. Many contracts are local. They don't need to be run on public blockchains. They don't want the public visibility that comes from running them on public blockchains. So any other arrangement that the cooperating parties can come to to mutually trust the platform that the contract is running on is adequate for that to participate in the overall fabric of our framework. I think we got to wrap it up. I want to say a couple things real quick. Uh, one, uh, and I said I wouldn't do this, but I want to elaborate on one point. Uh, just the, uh, uh, the uh, one thing that I think is really important to make clear is that uh, OCAP programming is just normal programming, actually. If you, if you remove global state, it's just pass it, argument passing between functions. And it doesn't require object-oriented programming, even you can do it in functional systems. It's literally just your variable references are object capabilities, and you pass them between functions. That's it. Um, so with that said, uh, we have an unconference to prepare to, part, largely due to my fault, including now. Uh, we have a little bit less time to prepare for it than we expected, but there's also, lunch will be arriving soonish. We, we have 12 minutes, uh, though we have scheduled an hour for lunch, and we can do a little bit of rearrangement during lunch. Um, and many people have thankfully already written down topics they'd like to propose. But what's going to happen is we are, have uh, post-it notes. Some of them have already been, uh, those ones represent the rooms and the times that we can allot things with. Some of these have already been written out and we'll arrange them on there. And the thing is, is that as a community, you should negotiate with the other people who have written down things they're interested in doing this afternoon and try to be like, oh, I really want to be able to go to yours, but it's at this time slot, and then try to see if we can collaboratively rearrange the schedule so that the people are mostly pretty happy in being able to go to the things that they're really excited about together. Um, so that's, that's what's happening now, so let's get to it.